A warm welcome, and we have the privilege in this land of a pretty good degree of freedom, and our numbers are just about to be increased, and that wasn't prophecy, I saw him coming. <laughs> I could have made something of that, couldn't I? Yes. <laughs> I do know of a case where it happened, actually, and they hadn't seen the people coming. Absolutely amazing. And a whole family were converted that day. And they became probably the single biggest family of ministers in the Assemblies of God. It was amazing. I'll tell you sometime. It's a subject in itself which is a reality all around us. And that is, in the Western world, being called a Christian doesn't generally cause us any problems. You might get the occasional matter which hits the headlines in the papers, and I'm not uh, minimising the effect on the individuals, and some end in courts, <clears throat> but the reality is when compared with what some of our brothers and sisters have to put up with in other parts of the world, it's trifling. The extreme, of course, is in places like North Korea, where just to be suspected of having a Bible means you're going to lose your freedom for a start and probably your head as well. So it's different in different parts of the world but all believers however they may be able in difficult situations to live out their faith live out their trust in Jesus Christ we all have the same duty to live out our lives and just because it's easier in the Western world doesn't mean that we can just, as it were, take a big yawn and take some time off. We are on duty, as it were, 24 hours a day, every day. There aren't any holidays for being a Christian. In the passage we read in Matthew chapter 3, and also the one in chapter 16. We saw something that was new to the understanding of the people. We saw God the Father declaring as to who this person was, Jesus. God the Son, the Son of God. Yes, there are references in the Old Testament, which you can look in Isaiah, for example, and you will find references which quite clearly show the Trinity. But this was something new. The Jewish people were expecting a Messiah, but most of them were expecting a Messiah to suit their ideas. And if anything, a political messiah who will just get rid of those Romans. That was what their immediate problem was. But Jesus came for a different reason. When he asked the disciples Who do men say that I am? He got a variety of answers. And some of them you could understand. But then he brought it down to a personal level. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, the impetuous one, said that he was the Messiah. And God 
pointed out that that wasn't something that had come from Peter's own mind, but it had been revealed to him by his heavenly Father. In the third passage in Romans chapter 13, we see something else, and that is that a high standard of life is demanded from those who say, identify themselves with Jesus Christ. Being a Christian isn't like being a member of a club. It's a commitment to a person, a commitment to God. Now thus far I imagine nobody's at all upset with anything I've said. But uh, who knows, somebody listening to this may think that uh, I've touched a raw spot. But I will say what I say because I believe it needs saying. That there are preachers who say that the message is come to Jesus and be happy. And I say to you, that isn't the message. <clears throat> the true gospel message is not come to Jesus and be happy, nor does it promise material wealth or prestige, or anything else. Rather, I could summarise it as repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent, and accept Jesus. And also, something which is very unpopular, and that is, Take up your cross and follow Jesus. The come to Jesus and be happy idea to me suggests a form of life, I won't call it a form of Christianity, a form of life which is, can I say, swanning through life without any problems. And so often, whether it's intended or not, that is how it comes over to me. Whereas the true call of the gospel message is repent, and walk the Christian life, dying to self. A radically different message. And if anyone is upset by what I say, all I will add is, don't let it bother you, because I have no intention of apologising. I am not like some clerics who've managed to tell the truth one day, and within 24 hours, they're apologising for having told the truth because someone was politically correct or someone was offended. Not on. I am not going to apologise for a single thing I say this day. I am dealing with the word of God and the word of God is God's revelation to mankind. It is not man's opinion of what he thinks God is like, or what he would like God to be. It is God's revelation. A very dear brother of our family, he came from 
England. He went to live in America. And from a human point of view, very sadly, he died last year in his 70s. On one of his visits over from America, where he'd emigrated, on one occasion, he used an expression which has stuck with me over the decades. And it is this. We must walk the walk and not talk the talk. And perhaps many of the Western so-called preachers would like to think about that and then compare what they are saying with brothers in Africa and similar places in the Philippines who are absolutely adamant that the word of God must be preached in all its truth and they have no time for tinkering with it and neither should we What I can promise you about the Christian walk is that it's a hard one. And what's more, it's not difficult, it's utterly impossible in our own strength. We have to walk it by the power of the Spirit. And we'll come to that a little later. It cannot be conducted in our own strength. We need to have the Spirit of God in us, which is what God does when we are saved. The Spirit indwells us. The Spirit himself is instrumental in us coming to a position of faith. Of ourselves, we cannot even think or consider God because we are evil. We are born in sin. The scripture tells us in John chapter 14 and verse 17 that the Holy Spirit indwells us. And it's important that we always keep that in mind. And that verse says this, the spirit of truth whom the world, that's the unbelievers, the nominal Christians, anybody who isn't a born-again believer, they're the world. The world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and listen to this, and will be in you. And again, we'll come to that a little later. The path of a true believer is a journey. And for many people of my generation, and before there was such a thing as the internet and Google and GPS, if you were going on a journey, the first thing you needed was a map. Many years ago, I was on a cycling holiday with the club in the area of Austria, Switzerland and northern Italy. And we were told what map we would need. There were various ones which were commercially available. For some unknown reason, one of the group, and few of us had known each other beforehand, there were about a dozen of us. One of them came with a map which was about this sort of size, and I'm not joking, it covered the whole of Europe. 
and we were supposed to be finding our way around mountain passes which weren't even marked on this map. It was just so ludicrous, nobody made any comment at all. You could read their minds, you didn't need a comment. The rest of us had maps which opened up this sort of square. And even those, we had to be careful that we didn't misinterpret something. We need a map as believers, and it's this. It's called the Word of God. And if we base our life, our teaching, our thinking, our behaviour on anything else, we have gone off the map. God doesn't tell us to do some things. He doesn't, for example, tell you what to have for breakfast. But he tells you the plans and purposes that he wants you to do. To follow. He tells you the way. And as I said, it isn't easy. Jesus talked about it as a difference between the broad way and the narrow way. If you like, which is easier to drive on? A motorway or a narrow, rough road? Well, of course, the motorway. But this was precisely the point that Jesus was making. The motorway, as it were, led to destruction. The rough track, the hard way led to life. And the principle is still the same, whatever particular picture you have in your mind of it. One thing we will find in this Christian life is that there will be conflicts with society, family, governments. If you haven't had them, well, you can expect them. And some people have uh, a good deal of trouble with these, particularly with governments. You've only got to look at places like Eritrea. Appalling treatment. North Korea, another one. The truth is that as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 17 and, eight and 18, <coughs> we are a new creation. God didn't take what we were and patch it up and give it a good coat of paint and saying, isn't it wonderful? It is a new creation. The old is gone. <coughs> it's a new creation. The key thing about this is that in our salvation, we have been reconciled to God. We generally talk about being saved and sometimes people aren't clear that they're not only saved from the sin and the consequences and the guilt, but they are saved to, as it were, save, to serve the living God. We are saved for a purpose. And the end of all things like that is to glorify God. We have nothing to be proud of as ourselves. Not only have we been reconciled, but we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. And part of being saved is that we are his witnesses, we are his servants. And we're not sat on the sidelines, or shouldn't be. We should be there, active, in spreading the good news 
to others. A lot of people, particularly in the Western world, are very reticent about sharing their faith. It used to be a common attitude in England that we don't talk about politics and religion. Well, I don't mind you not talking about politics. And I don't talk about religion either, because Christianity isn't religion, it's a relationship with the living God. And if that isn't something that's worth talking about, nothing is. And that is what we're supposed to do, to be his witnesses. It shows how seriously God takes this salvation. It shows that the come to Jesus and be happy attitude is gross error. True reconciliation with God demands a life of deep commitment and living for him. Or to put it as my friend did, to walk the walk. With Jesus. We don't walk that walk alone. And whatever our circumstances, good or bad, whatever trials there are, if we are the Lord's, we should be walking with Jesus. You may think that it's taken a while to get to this point, and I agree, but like many practical things in life, we must get the foundations right first. So, we're walking a different path compared with the world. And I have got two little readings from the prophet Isaiah, which I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> Isaiah 55 says this, verses 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And then in 8 and 9 it goes on, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so we see in those two sets of verses, there's a difference between the way we approach things and the way that God does. And the second one is in Isaiah 48 and verse 11. And it's a general principle, I think, is this, of what God is doing. Because in all his creation, he isn't amusing himself. He doesn't need to amuse himself. He's doing something very serious. And we find a similar reference in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. He says in verse 11, For my own sake, my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned? And I will not give my glory to another. 
in Ezekiel, you find he's remonstrating. It's nearly half a page in my Bible. He's having a real go. And he tells them that all he's done, he's not doing it for their benefit. He's doing it for the honour of his name. And it's important we grasp this. God will never allow anyone to displace him. Satan tried it and his followers and they got the answer and it was, as it were, out the door. An eternal punishment. Just for questioning God's position. If we truly believe there's a question which crops up actually in the Old Testament in an entirely different context, but it's worth remembering about it. Hezekiah, with Jerusalem under siege, and he was challenged by the Rabshika, the emissary. And he asked a question. What is this confidence you have? Well, the first time he said it. But later, he actually put this thing, sort of thing in writing. And Hezekiah took it. He went to the temple and he put it down before the Lord and basically said look what they're saying they're insulting your name how dare they the prophet Isaiah was uh, around at the time and basically he said don't you worry about them they won't get in here and they didn't You see, people who mock God, those that insult his name, will have to answer for it. But that is because they're not going the way that we're going. We should be going the way that the Spirit leads us. But the question is there. What is our confidence based on? Is it in Christ's finishing, atoning, finished atoning work on the cross? Because if it is not, we've not probably understood the enormity of our sin question our sin debt question and we need to grasp the mighty gospel truth that our salvation has been bought with a great price our salvation is through Christ and by grace through faith that is trust and not of anything that we could possibly do in addition, it is a finished work and can never be repeated. And it is also involving in our salvations the work of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 and verses 13 and 14 refer to it as the Holy Spirit being who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance and in chapter 5 verse 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 it puts it a slightly different way and it says as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come 
But the meaning is basically the same. So we see that as a true believer, we have a relationship with God. And we need to remember that when Jesus was asked by the disciples to teach them to pray, it starts off, our Father. The fact that we can call him our Father means that there is a relationship. And because we have, through reconciliation, being made sons of God, we find that in John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13, And we also now have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us as our guarantee of what is to come, our inheritance. But there's another side to this, and that is what does God expect of us? There are two sides to any relationship. It's difficult to convey the full weight of all this because some would say that uh, God just wants us to walk his way, well, which is true, but it is not something casual. It's not a little gentle walk in the country. Scripture talks us about putting on armour. It talks about warfare, spiritual warfare. It talks about us being alert. It gives a different picture, each one, from a pleasant little walk in the countryside. It's much more emphatic. And the reason it's more emphatic is quite simple. And that is God isn't asking us to do it. He demands that we walk that way. We must never, never, never lose sight of the fact that our Heavenly Father is the sovereign Lord God of all. What he wants, he will have. He is the Lord God, not man. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21, there's a little expression which I think just sums it up. It just says, this is the way walk in it. Similarly, in Isaiah 35, 8, it talks of a highway of holiness. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that God is rude in what it's, how it's being presented, but... you will have noticed that nowhere does God say please. In this life, amongst fellow human beings, if people don't say please and thank you, you think, oh, not very well mannered. But we're not dealing with man. We're dealing with the Lord of glory. And the reason he doesn't say please is because it's not a request. It's a command. And commands are there to be obeyed. We cannot, we must never attempt to pick and choose what suits us to have a little quiet life. That is not on. That is not part of what God is about. He has saved us for his purpose and he has equipped us and for each one who is a believer 
they will have been given gifts and it is incumbent for them to know what their gifts are and to use them for his glory. Now there are people who are politically correct or believe they are free to alter what God has commanded. And in the last decade, this Western world seems to have gone mad. I'm sure everybody is aware of the things I'm talking about. It's got to the stage where you cannot say something to somebody without being labelled a hate crime. You wonder what the world is coming to. But the point is, some of these governments, the politicians, seem to think they are free to alter what God has set in place. And in the morality of life, they are very mistaken. Simply because it is not their laws which are final, it's this. Jesus said that his words would never pass away. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Sometimes we hear things said with what I will call poetic license. I can remember one particular writer referring to the countryside around and he said about the eternal hills. Rubbish. They're not eternal. Only God's eternal. They might be there a long while. They were a long while before that person arrived on this planet and they're probably going to be there a very long while after he's gone. But they are not eternal. All things all the stars, everything we can see will one day be, as it were, wrapped up. And there isn't anything that mankind or Satan can do about it. Because God's plan of salvation, his plan for mankind is relentlessly moving on. Nothing can stop it or divert its path. One thing the politicians, particularly in the Western world, but it is spreading elsewhere, need to wake up to is the simple fact that so many of their more recent pronouncements must be like a stench in God's nose. You understand what I mean. He will not accept it. Our whole attitude to life and how it's worked out must, if we are believers, be governed by God's word. The principles are there, clear for all of us to see. And if you're anything, we are in doubt. There are always going to be other Christians that we can share it with and get to the truth. But biblical truth is paramount and it must not, and I will not, cut across it. No government in their right mind would pass some of the laws which have come into such countries as ours here in England. Even unbelievers who are decent people are horrified by it. But as unbelievers, they've nowhere to turn. But I and people like me have and that is the Lord of glory. It is not I that fear 
being prosecuted by the government. I don't fear that at all, and I mean that. What I fear is Almighty God and his wrath if I go against what he said. His word is final. God's law must be set firmly in our hearts. We have no other map, as it were, for our daily life. People don't spend time learning and memorising scripture for fun. It's hard work, but it's worth it because when it's inside, it does our souls good and our spirits good. He is God. We are his children. And we're also his ambassadors in this world. And Christians must not be people who are easily swayed by the world's ways. We must be people of integrity. And if people don't understand what I mean by integrity, I can recommend reading the book of Job. Reading the whole book in one go. You won't need to read it twice. You'll get the message. You'll find out what God thought. You'll find out what people thought, his wife, his friends. But you'll also find out what God said. You soon found out who was right. We must be people of integrity. In absolutely everything. Honest, truthful, upright in our dealings with God's standards firmly in our minds and walking in holiness. We may fail. We're still human, but there is forgiveness. There is renewal, restoration, forgiveness. You see, God isn't there to beat us down. He wants us to go on with him. And why? Well, it's very simple. In the second letter of Peter, in chapter 3, verse 18, it says this. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grow. We go on. We need help. There's no doubt about it. But the help is available. We are merely human. And the help that is available is what we've read about. The Holy Spirit the one alongside, the comforter. He is there all the time. I'll just read you from John chapter 14 and verses 15 to 18. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father... And he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither knows him nor sees him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you Orphans, I will come to you. I would just like in passing to say, please note, it doesn't say it. It says he, the Holy Spirit, is not some force. He is the third person of the Trinity. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, a triune God, co-equal, co-eternal, very much is the Holy Spirit a person. We need the Holy Spirit's help. It tells us in advance about the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. I'm referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what was the reason for it? I once had a minister, I'd only been saved about three years or so, three or four years, and he was an evangelical minister in the Church of England, and he said to me, what is the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I told him, I said, it's to give us power. That was the purpose. The Holy Spirit empowers us. If we read in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and Acts chapter 2, you'll see exactly what was meant. Without the Holy Spirit, they were powerless. It's as simple as that. The Holy Spirit is the promised helper of John chapter 14. He is the comforter, the one alongside us. So how's all this come together? Well, friends, I'm going to be quite blunt and just say to you, we need the fire of God in our souls. We need to be people of the word and people of prayer. People who not only believe in God, but believe God. That when God has said something, he means it. People who are available for God. We don't have to create situations for witnessing. All we have to be is available. I had it happen this last week. I've never had an opportunity to speak to that man before. I hadn't even seen him coming down the road. And he just called out. He came across and he shared some things with me. He's not a believer, a well-educated man. And I just listened. And I had the opportunity to just tell him what it was all about. That is what the Holy Spirit does. We need discernment when we are talking to people. But all that we do, as we see in Ezekiel 36, and in what we read in Isaiah, in chapter 48, verse 11, everything in our lives should be for the honour and glory of God. And if it's not, it's not God that's wrong, it's us. We need to be people with a passion for the lost. I'm not talking about walking around with a portable soapbox and standing on the street corner because particularly these days, it's going to probably be a big turn-off and they probably think, religious nut down the road here. No, we can generally reach people best when they're in a need <coughs> situation and it could be anything. It may be illness, it could be loss of job, anything. But there's a need and they want an answer 
and that's when we usually have our best opportunity. And don't think it's just one of these things. God puts us in a place at the right time and so often we just fail to grasp it and the opportunity is just gone. And it's thinking, I wish I could put the clock back, but we can't. We must use every opportunity that we can. We cannot save anybody. But the message which was brought to us, because someone said something, we have a duty to tell others. We cannot save anybody, but we can be workers in God's harvest field. This is what God wants from true believers, the true Christians. Our message must always be that salvation and fullness of spiritual life are only ever found in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Saviour, let his name be our watchword. Amen.